Mystery stories are my favorite literary genre, particularly of the sort set in medieval England. It all started with the Brother Cadfile Chronicles. Still, any detective story with interesting characters and clever plot development will do to prime the pump for the author's next book. Other types of dramatic stories also stimulate the search for the clues that litter daily life in order to make sense of the human journey. Recently, I saw the film Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, set against the backdrop of the terror attack on New York's World Trade Center towers. In this instance, a key found in a vase provides the clue to the mystery that will unlock an 11-year-old's quest to understand his father's death in that inferno. His search for meaning finds him in battle with his fears. Hope is rewarded. Every storyteller endeavors to reveal to others the truth about the human condition by examining evidence, making sense of it, and declaring life's purpose for that storyteller's generation and those to come. Such a storyteller was Luke, a follower of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who prepared what he called an orderly account to declare the truth of Jesus the Savior. In his Gospel's first two chapters, he offers several family snapshots that reveal lives of faithfulness and obedience to God. In these we glimpse the priestly status of his uncle Zechariah, the miraculous birth and the prophetic calling of his cousin John, Jesus' mother's favored status in God's eyes, evoking and affirming the coming days when the reign of God would be established on earth, and the angelic announcement not to the king nor to the high priest, but to lowly shepherds that the long-awaited Messiah had been born. The pre presentation of the child Jesus in the temple commemorated today is the final episode in this gospel's infancy narratives. Luke's background folder on Jesus of Nazareth is already thick when the child is presented in the temple in Jerusalem to fulfill the Torah's rite of dedication. And actually, two transactions occur on this occasion. First, 40 days after childbirth, his mother is ready to re-enter life in the community and offers the appointed sacrifices. And second, according to the law, every child, every boy child born of Jewish parents is holy to the Lord and is dedicated to God's service unless purchased with the, the redemption price of five shekels to free him for nurturing by his birth parents. Now parents, beware. There is no direction in the baptismal rite in the Book of Common Prayer for the child once signed, sealed, and declared Christ's own forever to be returned to his family of origin. Actually, the newly baptized is welcomed into a new family altogether, widening the circle of responsible Christian nurturers. Well, I digress. So, the stage is now set for two last witnesses for, G for God's cause. Simeon and Anna are like surrogate grandparents through the decades, marked by heartache and joy, each remained faithful, trusting God to fulfill the promise to save the chosen people. In wonder they gaze. In wonder they gaze. That is something 
the parents and grandparents do so well with an infant cradled in one's arms. In wonder they gaze at this 40-day-old infant that has been dedicated to God. And the eyes of faith discern that the promised day is at hand. But as with all good things, there is a cost to be borne. Simeon said, as the, the message translates the text, this child marks both the failure and the recovery of many in Israel, a figure misunderstood and contradicted, the pain of a sword thrust through you. But the rejection will force honesty as God reveals who they really are. an oracle of hope and a wise crone have added their profound belief that God's saving purpose will be accomplished in Jesus. And finally, Luke concludes the nativity narrative by saying, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Thus began Luke's orderly account. He's prepared his hearers, readers, with an insider's perspective of the faithful, compassionate ministry of Jesus that culminates in his passion and death. Like a defendant's advocate, the infancy narrative is Luke's opening argument to be fleshed out in succeeding chapters. His evidence is in the form of snapshots of those who surround the infant Jesus. The images represent important elements in his story, including Israel's sacred history, obedience to the Torah, temple worship, and the special mission of Jerusalem, all of which are essential to understand the saving work of Jesus. The Torah, the law of Moses, describes that a male child was to be dedicated 40 days after his birth. Now our calendar sets that day as February 2nd, last Thursday. Let me make a short cultural detour. February 2nd is more familiar to us as Groundhog Day. Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, makes the unassailable claim to the right and the official groundhog mascot for the nation. There are those others who will try to take Punxsutawney Phil's place, but they don't quite make it. And last Thursday, February 2nd, <clears throat> the ordained high priest and or orator of the occasion suitably dressed in top hat and tails, <clears throat> declared the bad news of six more wink weeks of hard winter. And wouldn't you know it, Denver got a blizzard. Now this has meaning in the Northern Hemisphere, where for generations, February 2nd, has held the distinction of being the midpoint between the winter solstice and the vernal equinox, explaining the six weeks or so until spring weather is assured. Now, take that and a few bucks and you can get a latte. Is there any linkage between the dedication of Jesus in the temple and the cross quarter day of February 2? Perhaps this is another epiphany, an aha moment, a pledge of hope for those who suffer from seasonal affective disorder, that we are moving on toward days with more and more light. Have faith, be patient. In the person of Jesus, seasonal change is occurring. Maybe we can perceive the path to God's love being illuminated as the child grew strong in body and wise in spirit and the grace of God 